Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are ready to start. Okay, right. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome this afternoon to this very special session titled Research in Accounting. Um, I've got a long list of welcomes here, so let me quickly get that out of the, out of the way. I see some, some people I haven't seen for a very, very long time here as well. Um, so firstly, just a warm welcome to all of you, all of our attendees um, today that are physically present here. I, I see many familiar faces um, from, from all across um, the, 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 the academic sphere. So perhaps quickly just, uh, Mandy, I see you here from Saika as well. So warm welcome to you. Um, I see our colleagues uh, from WITS. Uh, they're, they're all kind of sitting all over the place as well. Um, Denise, Andrew from Pretoria. I, I must be careful here that I don't miss anybody. This is the faith looking at me and saying, Ahmed, you're going down a dangerous road here. Um, so, so I see, welcome to you as well, the guys from Pretoria. Faith, I haven't seen you in a very long time. Welcome to you too as well. Um, guys, there's a lot of unfamiliar faces here, but uh, Yaish, I see you there. Welcome to you. And um, Dennis, welcome to you as well. Great to have you here. Our, our head of school, Professor Amanda Dempsey, welcome to you as well, uh, folks. And then, uh, most importantly, on the right here, a very warm welcome to South Africa, Daryl and Anne. It's great to have you. I hope you're having a wonderful experience so far. And then to our folks on the live streaming. So we've basically got attendees uh, that are, are watching this from, from locally and abroad, certainly many of the universities. Our marketing director, Andre just said to me that um, I must give a shout out to the guys at Stellenbosch University. I believe they've got a whole room set aside for the streaming, as well as the guys from UCT, the guys from, uh, from Free State. I know Rickus and them at Northwest are also streaming in. So that's fantastic. This is really, really uh, wonderful that we've got everybody here. Um, quickly, Daryl and, and Anne, if I may just do a short introduction. So Daryl's basically a member of the ISB, the board, since October 2010, having been a member of the IFRS Interpretations Committee and effectively a member of what was then or now called the IFRS Advisory Council, reappointed to the board to serve a second term in 2015. Prior to joining the board, Daryl was the CFO of First Rand. Uh, he was responsible for both financial reporting under the IFRS standards and regulatory reporting under the Basel II Accords. Um, he's also the chairman of the board's SME implementation group. Daryl, it's great to see you again. Welcome back. We've had a similar session a couple of years, which was very beneficial, and we're really looking forward to it again this time around. Then, Anne, a very warm welcome to you. I believe it's your second time in South Africa. Uh, Anne Tarka joined the ISB from the University of, and I'm going to try and get the Australian accent here, the university, and I'm not even going to try, <laughs> the University of Western Australia's business school, where Anne, like many of us, was an accounting teacher and researcher since 1996 and a professor since 2011. Professor Tarka served as a member of the ASB from 2014 to 2017 and was research director for the ASB from February 2017. She was an academic fellow of the IFRS Foundation from 2011 to 2012, uh, authored a textbook on accounting, written a wide range of research papers related to IFRS, and received many awards as well. Professor Tarka is an active member of the international accounting academic community, serving on several boards and committees. She qualified as a chartered accountant in 1985 and a PhD in accounting from the University of Western Australia. A warm welcome to both of you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Folks, then just a couple of admin things here. So um, I think just as important as a presentation is the food afterwards. So uh, Andre reminded me that there will be some snacks afterwards and please, uh, please partake with that. The bathrooms, uh, you exit out that way to the right. Then um, there are slides for the presentation as well. Uh, they are uploaded here. But 
What I suggest you do is we have been circulating those slides out to the folks, but I don't think we were able to get it to everybody. So if you just latch on to a UJ person who's sitting near you, they can quickly email those slides to you and, and you'll, have, you'll have those slides. Um, and I think that is probably everything um, that we need to cover. We also have some handouts there as well. Ingrid, I'll pop a copy of the slides to you in a second. Point Hussein as well. Dennis, I'll send you a copy as well. Okay, great. I think Anne, Daryl, we're we ready for you. Thanks very much. Um, it is good to be back again. As you mentioned, we've we've had done one of these before in the past. Uh, I spent a lot of time as an ISB board member um, out selling uh, some of our projects, specifically spent a lot of time with IFRS 17 insurance. And, and the, the big thing about insurance audiences is that they, they're quite aggressive, quite take you on type of audiences. But I find this audience far more intimidating. So I'm really, really glad to say that I'm going to be chatting for a few minutes and then handing over to the, the, um, uh, the expert in the field and, and, and let Anne do a little bit more talking around the research side of the ISB and what we do in that sort of space. Um, essentially what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing a little bit of a, a cop out and then I'm just going to give you some of the very basic background of where the ISB is right now, what our sort of um, main projects are, just to give you a sort of a taste for what's happening in the ISB world and then as I say I'll give the really meaty topics to Anne. Um, so what I wanted to start talking about was um, our publications at the moment, what the new stuff that is out in, in, in the ISB world. The first of these things is obviously the conceptual framework. And the ISB spent a lot of time working on the conceptual framework as one of our priority projects over the last couple of years. We thought it was really important, and it, it, it sounds a little bit like motherhood and apple pie, but we felt that it was really important from an ISB perspective to work off a proper foundation. It helps, arguably, to bring a lot more consistency to our standards if we've got consistent thinking and something we can refer back to. We previously had a conceptual framework in place, so there was one there before, but that had become outdated over time. And as practices had changed, as types of accounting had changed, um, the approaches that were suggested by the old conceptual framework had become harder to apply in practice. And what we had started to see is with our newer standards as they came out, there were some really big differences in the way that we were thinking about things under the new standards and where the old conceptual framework was pointing us to. So getting the conceptual framework out was a really big deal in, in terms of re-establishing that base. Um, it took a little bit longer perhaps than we'd expected, but having it out there now is useful. The other things that have come out as final documents, definition of business, which is just, for those of you who follow what the ISB does, um, we try to do a PIR approach on all of our new standards, post-implementation review. One of the standards we did a post-implementation review on recently was IFRS um, 3. We identified two things out of IFRS 3 that we thought we really needed to think about. One was definition of a business. The other one was goodwill. Uh, we've punted a little bit on Goodwill. I'll talk about that maybe in a second. But the definition of a business, the final document will be coming out shortly on that. And then one of the big objectives I was given when I started out at the ISB by my ex-boss at First Rand um, was that we had to figure out this whole overload of disclosure thing. He thought that was something that was, as far as he was concerned, the most pressing issue. And we've been doing a lot of stuff around disclosure. We've been doing a lot of stuff around materiality. So one of the other final things that will be coming out in, in the next couple of months is the definition of materiality. And that new definition of materiality goes along with the documents we issued a couple of, uh, a year or so ago, which was the guide on how to think about materiality, the, the, the practice note that helped people work through the thinking in the materiality space. And then if you are really looking to punish yourself, we have a consultation document out at the moment on financial instruments with characteristics of equity. It's a um, very comprehensive document dealing with thinking about the difference between equity and liabilities. Now, this is not an easy topic. Again, going back to my background, I came out of a, a, a financial institution background. This was, uh, IS32 was one of the places where we had absolute field days with seeing, essentially you would ask your customer when they came in, well, what do you want it to be, equity or liability? And we'll figure out how to get it there for you. 
So this is an important project for the ISB in trying to provide a conceptual starting point for the way you think about uh, equity and liability, and then building that into a standard. This is out for commentary until June 2019. Anne and I will be at the working group tomorrow to talk a little bit about it, another important part of, of, of what we've got coming out. Then we've got a couple of small amendments that I won't go into, just to say on the taxonomy, we're taking that as quite a serious new initiative. I know South Africa is moving in that direction now to try and make sure the taxonomy is fit for the purpose we see it as being, which is that alternate delivery mechanism. Um, active product projects that we're busy with at the moment, the better communication one, this is the one where I said I responding to responding to my old boss, trying to get financial statements both shorter but more useful for people who are using them. Rate regulated um, will be coming out shortly. That is in a big way going to affect companies like ESCOM that have the ability to reprice, or, or, or not have the ability, have a repricing agreement or a repricing regulator that adjusts their pricing mechanism based on what they've experienced cost-wise and income-wise over time. Um, the other big one that I'd, I mentioned earlier that I'd pick up on there is the goodwill and impairment. I think um, we started out very ambitiously coming out of the IFRS 3 uh, post-implementation review with the idea that what we wanted to try and do was to address the, the, the struggles people were having with impairment calculations of goodwill in practice. And really, we were trying to solve two contradictory problems. The first problem was making it easier to do the impairment calculation. The second problem was to provide useful information faster. So users were telling us by the time an impairment, a goodwill impairment comes out, it's too late. And preparers were telling us this calculation is too hard to do. And we worked our way down a very comprehensive route to see whether or not we could come up with a solution that solved both of those problems. What happened in the most recent board, uh, in July board meeting, was that the board decided that there wasn't really this perfect key that was going to unlock everything. So we're taking a big step back on goodwill, on, on impairment, to see whether there's a different approach we can do, and that might be a disclosure-based approach. It might be another discussion paper to see if we can delve deeper into that issue. Um, I'm not going to touch on any other projects except to mention the very bottom one because this might be a little bit of an emergency project as things work. For those of you who follow financial markets in the world, um, there is an impending change coming across the world as um, regulators force the banking sector or the financial sector to move away from the what's called the IBOR type calculations, so LIBOR, EURIBOR, and et cetera onto a new system that is perceived to be more independent and more robust than what those systems were. The target date for that is two th for that regulatory is 2020. Uh, we're seeing something similar happening in South Africa with Jibar, so the same type of change is happening there. The real difficulty with this is it's creating, at the first instance, a lot of economic uncertainty. I've got contracts that run for 20 years as a banking company. Those, those contracts, if they reference Jibar, they reference LIBOR, they are going to change to something. But right now, nobody knows what that is. So at the first instance, I've got economic uncertainty. If I'm hedging products that use, let's say, LIBOR, then my hedges now have economic uncertainty in them because I don't know what's going to replace the rate. I don't know how well it's going to work. And then all of that kicks back into the accounting. How do I start to do forecasting for financial instruments, for fair values of financial instruments? How do I determine effectiveness of hedging in circumstances where I don't know what I'm going to be forced to change to? And so there's a lot of uncertainty from an economic perspective that's starting to be reflected in the accounting world. This is a project that's likely to come back to the board in the next month or two, and when it does, it's one that the board is going to, be heavy, going to have to move quite quickly on to resolve the uncertainty that's developing here. There was a high level input, oh, just the, better, the, the, the big communication one. I just wanted this slide up here just to remind everybody that this is still a central theme, that we're still spending a lot of time looking at, at communication issues, disclosure, primary financial statements, and management commentary, and that that as, is as a big discussion point in terms of the way we go forward. And that, 
was meant to be my very quick introduction on the high-level stuff that's happening at the ISB. And now what I'm going to do is going to hand over to Anne, who's going to talk about the stuff that you actually hear to hear, hear about. So let me pass over to Anne, and it's all yours, and I can relax. Thanks, Daryl. <laughs> Daryl's going to take his tie off now in the interest of being relaxed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for the warm welcome. And I'm also welcome those who are not in the room with us, but uh, are participating electronically. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with Daryl today and talk to you about accounting research. Our brief, as we received it, was that you'd be interested in knowing um, how the IASB makes use of research and also what makes research useful to us. So uh, that's the subject of our slides. Um, they, will, they are available and we will put them up on our website as well after today. And um, I'm happy to take questions as we go. This slide documents the standard setting process that is used by the board and it reflects a decision made by the trustees standard setting be evidence based. So several years ago, an explicit decision was made to use evidence more in making standards. And that's good for us as academics. Um, so I use a very general us now. Um, I I'm a full-time board member, um, so I'm not an academic anymore, but having spent 20 years in academia, I identify with yourselves, with your work very much, um, as a precursor to the standard setting program. And our aim there is that we can spend more time in the research phase with specific objectives. So the idea of the research program is that questions can be looked at, we can work out what the problem is, do some preliminary work to get an idea of the extent of the problem and whether it should be addressed. And then things may stop, the project may stop, the project may then go to the standard setting agenda. And when it goes to standard setting, the idea is that the preliminary work that's been done provides a strong ground and that the standard setting phase will proceed more quickly. So today we are going to look at what's on the research program and also in the pipeline. But things on the research program get looked at and then they can then go on to the standard setting agenda. So research program projects could have a discussion paper and then go on to standard setting or they can go from research agenda onto standard setting agenda even before we do a consultative document. I'll give you some examples of those today. We have um, a web page for academics on our website, you may have seen it. We're hoping that we can do more with that in the future and provide more up-to-date materials, but that, that is where you'll find the slides for today. So our active research projects, um, you would see some of these in Daryl's slide already. So currently the board and staff are working on business combinations under common control, the disclosure initiative, principles of disclosure, dynamic risk management, and extractive activities. We've recently taken extractive activities um, onto our research agenda, and this is a very good time for academics to get involved. If you search on extractive activities, our project, you'll see that nothing has been decided. Nothing, that's right. So um, those of you with long memories will know that there has been um, at least two reports. One very detailed report from the IASC days on extractive activities and then a discussion paper in 2010 on extractive activities. Now at that time, the board had to stop. There were other priorities and other projects needed to be attended to. So now the board has brought it back again and we are looking to see what has happened since the time of 2010, and we are speaking to the national standard setters that are involved or were involved in the 2010. And then we will also be consulting much more widely because there are many other countries now in the IFRS family that are involved in extractive activities. So where does that put you living in a country where extractive activities is hugely important for your economy and as academics? So we haven't scoped the project. We are interested in whatever research you've got going. 
there's a couple of ways to feed into our process. Either you have a project already that you can tidy up and feed in, or you may undertake new work. Now, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk to you about how we use your output. Now, that'll give you better ideas about the sorts of things you might undertake. So, extractive activities, I see it as wide open. We do have a research forum, you may be aware. We'll be doing our fifth research forum, so an IASB research forum, this year in Australia, in November on the 11th and 12th. As part of that, we're having a panel session with folks who are involved in the extractive activities industry. We'll also be hearing an academic paper, and it's a literature review paper. So that's a good starting point. If this area is interesting to you, get that paper, which will be up on our website. Have a look in there. That gives you an idea of all the studies that this team could find. And then looking into that, you may see research opportunities that you can bring back to us over the course of the project. All being well, we'll be working on this for quite some years because that's the nature of standard setting projects. Uh, it's really important that uh, having determined that we think there's a problem that needs to be addressed, which in this case is that we have only an interim standard and also that we're aware of diversity in practice, two good reasons. We haven't scoped the project, so we are really looking for guidance and academic work valuable to us. So extractive activities, I draw that. Dynamic risk management, uh, that's the macro hedging. If you do work in this area, you'll be aware that this has been a very challenging area for standard setters. There is quite a deal of academic work. I'm, I'm not suggesting anything in particular at the moment, except perhaps if you're a person that likes to do um, research of a nature that's uh, experimental with uh, human subjects, that type of research, or research that involves um, interviews or surveys, that sort of work. There's a lot we don't know about financial instruments accounting. So it's not so much in dynamic risk management that you'd necessarily have data you could use, though any data on hedging could be relevant. But there are other areas, other techniques of research that could certainly inform us in a project like that. Disclosure initiative. That's one of our big projects that fits in the slide that came, that Daryl referred to a few slides ago, our better communication initiative. Um, Daryl referred to his experience of being told to um, do something about disclosure overload. So from 2013 onwards, the board and staff have really been addressing this issue of disclosure overload. And we have a series of projects, and the disclosure initiative, principles of disclosure, is part of that. So if you're a person who works in the area of disclosure research, and many people do, have a look at your work. Have a look in what ways you could inform us on this topic. I'll give you a couple of examples as we talk today about work that's being done that will inform us, we hope, on disclosure initiative. Um, business combinations under common control. A as we understand it, some entities will pick up IFRS 3 acquisition accounting and use it for their combinations in this area. Others will use predecessor accounting. So we know that because people have given us some descriptive statistics, but it would be great to know much more about that. Colleagues have, have work in that area, it would be very interesting to hear about it. Also, on our active research agenda, Daryl's mentioned the FICE project. If you want to do behavioural type research, the research with human subjects, you could try out, you could try that out, you could try and test whether you think that our new rationale that we're putting forward in the FICE DP helps people as they're making those debt and equity type decisions. Goodwill and impairment as a very big area, very big for us. There are many, many papers on goodwill and impairment. There are many unanswered questions in that area as well. 
In deciding whether you want to research in that area, you'd have a look at a few of the literature reviews that exist. So on the one hand, you'd look at our board papers so you can see what our thinking is and what way we want to take this project forward. But you'd also look into the literature reviews and see what it is we know and equally what we don't know because there is a lot we don't know. And the more we hear from academics, the more helpful it is. Um, the Goodwill and Impairment project comes out of IFRS 3 post-implementation review, as Beryl said. And coming out of that post-implementation review, the board did make use of literature reviews, and did, the staff did make use of existing research. So more studies in that area to address questions that we are still not clear about would be very beneficial. Eyeball reform has only recently come on to that research agenda um, and I haven't even thought yet where the research fits. So those of you in the room who work in that area, follow that, we'll come up with ideas. The pensions project is very narrow uh, if it does go on into standard setting. Um, pensions more broadly is a very important topic area. Pensions itself uh, has, uh, there is a body of research where people are looking at that, but of course that's an extremely important area for social policy. So there are plenty, plenty of things um, to look at, though not something that we have particularly on our standard setting agenda. We don't, other than this narrow project, uh, we're not looking at that at the moment, having had some work quite within the last five years. On so, there are our projects, some high-level comments and ideas. This is the pipeline. Now, for researchers, the pipeline is often more interesting and exciting than the research agenda, because the pipeline projects have a longer timeline, gives you more time to work on things, and I certainly know how long it takes to project from the beginning of the idea to when that happy day when you actually see the journal with the paper in it has got a bit quicker now, hasn't it, with electronic um, papers available electronically. But nevertheless, um, standard setting is not speedy for very good reasons, and academic research is not speedy either. Um, so we are looking for academic evidence. And so the pipeline projects are projects where you do have a bit more time. Uh, in particular, let's talk about equity method. Those of you who teach equity method know that it's a, it's a method that uh, really lacks um, principles and reasons and sometimes it's quite hard to explain to students what you're actually doing and what do you end up with when you apply the equity method. I think equity method is wide open for change in terms of standard setting um, and so any research that feeds in and shows where problems lie and areas that could be improved would be very useful. We will do a post-implementation review on IFRS 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, and equity method will come up as part of that. The project to do with high inflation is a very narrow scope project, and it's about whether we might allow, is that suit IS 29, would it be suitable for countries that are high inflation? Not, not very high, just high and that would be narrow and we need to look at that and think about that. Uh, third one there, pollutant pricing mechanisms. It's an area that's of great interest to many researchers because it touches into the environmental and social disclosure areas. It's an area that has wider interest in our communities because of the um, intergenerational impacts. We don't have anything specific at the moment, but we know it's an issue and an important issue in many countries. So more information, more research on pollutant pricing mechanisms will be of interest. Provisions, IAS 37. We did a lot of work on this and then paused our work until we issued the conceptual framework. And as you know, conceptual framework has a new definition of liabilities. So we have issued conceptual framework now, as Daryl mentioned, we are now looking back at that IAS 37 work that we've done and deciding um, what, what our next steps are. 
I think the area of liabilities, the area around the provisions is particularly important. It's very important in um, extractive activities as well. So this is the one that uh, crosses over um, and we'd be interested in work on that. Variable and contingent consideration is a narrow scope project. And finally, SMEs that are, sub are subsidiaries. What's up on the board there is something we want to investigate, whether, whether it would be possible, whether it would be feasible, whether it would be useful to think about recognition and measurement using full IFRS and disclosure using IFRS for SMEs disclosure. So if you're interested in research in this area, just keep watching when, when that one goes on and what we intend to do. The bigger picture of SMEs is really important. I know it's particularly important in Africa, but there are other markets and other countries where IFRS for SMEs is very important. And there is an emerging body of research coming now. So if you wanted to pick up in that area, that would be very useful, particularly because we are going to review the IFRS for SMEs. And we're going to start that work in 2019, starting on that work next year, and that'll be a very important area of work. So if there are academic papers that can tell us about how people are experiencing it, both from a preparer side, also from a user side, you've got the regulators in this space, you've got the regulators, people like um, financiers or organisers of finance like the World Bank uh, have been active in this area. So any research that can help us as we go into the review phase, we'd also be grateful to know about. Okay, so that was a very high level on projects, the research agenda and also the pipeline. You can get more details on all of those things on our website and clicking through on any of those topics will take you to information about where we're up to at the moment. For the projects that are the research projects that we're currently working on, there's a lot of papers and a lot of detail. The ones in the pipeline, less so. I'm very happy to, um, myself and Tom Scott, who is also has an academic background, very happy to help researchers in terms of talking about projects, things that are of interest. So if you wish to contact either Tom or myself, please email us and we're happy to uh, answer questions on any aspects you might have about your projects. Um, I've talked already to this slide. Uh, okay, Post-implementation reviews. Uh, I might pause though, we've just gone at a very high level across a number of topics. I'll pause and see if we have any questions at this stage. Yes. Uh, within the disclosure initiative, do you think that there's still space for academic research to start on that phase, given how far the board is with, with the project at the moment? I think that research that's in progress could be useful. I think it's difficult to start a new project that tries to address something because you'd be very much paralleling what we're doing. So, for example, one of the things in Disclosure Initiative, we're looking at whether we can work more with disclosure objectives and disclosure principles and less with specifics. And if people had already had projects in train that could speak to that, that would be very useful. But I think probably it would depend how rapidly. If someone was going on a year's sabbatical, yes, no problem, because then they could get in and do it. A disclosure research is interesting because it's changed so much now that we have the um, technology tools that we do. Um, those of you who've been researching for years will remember checklists and ticking off items. A couple of examples I'm going to give you, people are still doing that. And it depends what people are chasing, what information they're chasing. And it's hard to substitute what AI can do for us compared to what our brains can do when it's a qualitative analysis of disclosure. Um, so we do need help with that. We, we need to know. We know when there are checklists and people tick off checklists and a lot of disclosure research tells us disclosure compliance is incomplete.
when particularly when we looked at IFRS 3, IAS 36, that was the very strong message from dozens of studies. Disclosure is incomplete. Um, so now we need to know more about that. Why is it? Why is it incomplete? Uh, why do the researchers say it's so incomplete? What is that? Where does the auditor fit in this? Um, where does materiality fit? Sometimes when I look at the academic papers, I'm not sure if the researchers have spoken enough to the practitioners to understand materiality lens. So there's there's a lot we need to know, but you, your point's a good one. I'm, I don't know. There's only certain circumstances where someone could start new work that was that was focused on that project. Can I just come in on something? Yes. I agree completely with everything Anne said. The one thing I would add, though, is, is we, we've got, if, if you think about the new approach that we are taking to disclosures going forward, we're moving more from the, the sort of old-fashioned, here's what you disclose, to a, here's what you need to think about in the disclosure. And essentially, we've got a live experiment going on that right now with IFRS 9 and IFRS 15. So even if it's not directly into this disclosure project process at the moment, I think anything you guys would look to do to understand the usefulness and the way that, you, know, you talked about behavioral studies and people study, yeah. the way people are thinking about how they get to the disclosures under 15 and 9, I think it would be very useful for us just in terms of the way we think about it going forward, whether people actually do go through an objective-based approach or whether they somehow slip back into using the big audit firm's checklists and they, they're doing checklists anyway. The negative people will tell us that it has to be a checklist and it's got to be ticked off. And, and that's what one aspect of disclosure overload. So on the principles of disclosure on the discussion paper, that's what, what we heard. So we're trying this idea of trying to encourage people to take this more, uh, looking at the principles and are they meeting disclosure objectives. So Daryl's referring to, um, up on your screen there, you can see 9 and 15 and then shortly 16. Um, were you to have a look at those disclosures where there are more objectives, that would be so interesting for us and it'll feed into the PIRs. Now those PIRs are still two to three years out, minimum. At least, at least two to three years out because you know, this is still just the first year for, um, it's only if you were beginning in January, uh, IFRS 9, you'd just be doing your first year end, year one disclosures now in December. So they are, they are live, um, there's good opportunities there. So we need to know more about, yes, the output that we see in, in the financial documents, but also, as Daryl's pointing to do, more about the process of thinking if you have access through your MBA classes, for example, into people who have um, experience already in the workplace, so they're more mature, if you have access to those type of people, you can set up experiments where or some sort of interactive experiments, how they're responding to how they're thinking and what their process is. So, you know, we mustn't always think about everything in terms of big databases and econometrics and the modeling there are for, for standard setters, there are many other areas of research that's, in, that's informative. And for some people, it is, it is easier for them to do that type of work. It's not that the work is easy, it is just as demanding as the other sort of work. But for people that can access subjects, um, and those subjects, for example, you might be able to access people in, who, are, who have finished at university and are in chartered accounting and they're doing training, you might be able to access through um, uh, I think we have, uh, was it Mandy who's here from? Mm -hmm. So through the professional um, associations, you may have opportunity to access into and be part of training courses. And as part of those training courses, um, you can be uh, exposing people and getting um, information that way. So data collection. So it's important to work out what you can do with the resources that you have um, but there are many, there are many ways to get the evidence on the problems. Any other questions? Yes. Um, on the materiality, I know there's one company in South Africa that verbally said that they've reduced their financial statement um, significantly. And I've seen just last week the integrated report, they've reduced from about 150 pages to less than 50 pages. 
And I started with that um, materiality document. Mm. Yes. Yes. There's, there's always a dilemma in academic research between what some people call the descriptive statistics and what some people call the real research. So if we think about um, a published research paper, we have um, a, a motivating question, we have a research question, we have a hypothesis, and somewhere in there we have a theory, and we're coming off that theory to motivate these hypotheses, having worked out what the problem is, what the motivating question is. And then we will work out a method, uh, we will then produce some descriptive statistics. We will have other sorts of modelling in there, if, it's, if this is an empirical data-based type work. Uh, we will test these hypotheses, we will reach conclusions and circle back and talk about whether the, how the theory has informed what we've done, are the hypotheses supported, and then what the implications are. At that point, we hope you're talking about what the implications are for standard setters as well. So not just the implications, not just how you've contributed by adding to a body of knowledge, adding to a stream of literature, but also the practical implications, be they policy implications for auditors or regulators or standard setters. So within that, it's quite often descriptive statistics that are vitally important for standard setters because we just want to know how much did this happen. So in your example, we'd like to know how often did that happen and then were the people responding to the, materi the new materiality guidance? We would love to know that because we don't know that. So as people do their research, there's sections of it that are very informative to us. So how many companies changed following a, a change in regulation? So we have new materiality guidance, and, and so materiality practice statement is a guidance statement. So did, did we see any changes? We also made some changes in IAS 1 regarding materiality. Can we see any changes? Did companies actually change? Now, one way we try and see changes is look at the annual report themselves. But another way we find out about changes is speaking to people who are informed. So you would expect auditors to know quite a bit about this. And if you can get access to a number of auditors, those auditors have access to dozens of clients. And in that way, you can find out about what practices, what's going on. So we are interested in that sort of thing. Yes? I just have a question. Uh, you probably have to have the mic first. I just have a question. As yes. we move towards these more professional judgment uh, type standards. Isn't there a risk in the economy that we're going to move away from the concept of public interest? Because remember, the objective of financial reporting doesn't actually factor in public interest. And in light of all these scandals that we're seeing, uh, as, uh, as preparers of these financial statements, and uh, the biggest challenge is going to be that the more professional judgment we have, the more the expectation gap between the auditor uh, and the preparer so we ultimately would lose. Wouldn't that add more cost and benefit to consider in terms of public interest? Because I don't see it coming anywhere through the ISB's agenda, public interest. So that's like a bit concerning for me. A great question. Let's put the auditors aside first. Let's talk about the, what the conceptual framework tells us about who, who are the users of the information. And the users, there's quite a number of people mentioned by name as users of the information. And obviously that includes investors and future investors, but it also includes creditors and lenders and other parties. And I think through that group of users means that the information has to be robust and suitable for them for their purposes. So although you don't see the words public policy or public interest, I think because there is this user group that the preparers should be thinking about, I think that that's a broad cross-section of society, so they do have to think about it. That's one thing. Another thing, if you look at our mission statement, IASB mission statement on the face, or, you know, it's, it's immediately there on the website. That's about um, providing information um, for capital markets, for efficiency, for transparency, uh, again, the public interest words are not there, but something along those lines, it's about, um, I'm going to use the stability word, that's not the word that's there either. I'm sure there's a few devices in the room, someone can get the mission statement up. But in the mission statement, it has got a much broader reference to um, 
stock markets and communities, you know, economic communities. It isn't just about serving the people who are the users of capital. Uh, the mission statement of IFRS is about... Trust, growth, and sorry. <laughs> I'll read the whole. Yes. Our mission statement is to develop IFRS standards that bring transparency, accountability, and efficiency to financial markets around the world. Our work serves the public interest by fostering trust, growth, and long term financial stability in the global economy. So I, I think it's, it's there. Uh, it's certainly there and it's behind IFRS Foundation and ISB. But your specific question is, if we have principles and the principles uh, are taken on board by preparers, uh, won't this just be driven by whatever standards the preparers have? Um, so yes, I, I think we see appalling corporate scandals because the, there are instances where preparers have not behaved in the public interest, they've behaved in self-interest. So to what extent do we write accounting standards that narrow the ability of entities to do this? Uh, if you follow the, the work of the standard setters, you will hear discussions uh, around, is this provision an anti-avoidance provision? To what extent do we want this provision because we're going to curtail certain behaviour? So we are aware of it and it gets discussed. I think the principles that get adopted are the ones that, by consensus, the board believes will achieve the best outcome. And occasionally you'll see them modified to try and limit behaviour. Um, think about principles and rules. One of the things the research tells us is when you put a black line rule down, people go around it. And it comes out strongly from the US literature because the US have certain instances of black lines. So there are, there are rules in IFRS, of course there are, but US GAAP has these certain black lines that are being researched. So when you say principles have to be interpreted and judgment has to be used, that's absolutely right. But the answer isn't to go into rules because they get works around. And you, we, can't, we, we can't go to rules because we're in 145 different countries and it, we just can't go there. That's not going to work for us. But, you know, your point is one. For us as an academic community, we have to think all the time as we're educating the next generation um, quite how we're educating them towards thinking that these judgments and estimates that they're allowed to make are not the judgments and estimates to favour themselves. So if you think about the contribution that academics can make, think about the extensive literature on share-based payment, on the manipulation of stock options. Now, a lot of that is US-based literature because the US market is the most driven, the profit-driven, and there are so many incentives the extent to which those incentives are in place in other markets seems to vary because there's a lot of research to show you you, you don't get stock-based compensation as an explanatory factor in the European research, whereas you'll get it as an explanatory factor for what it is you're investigating, maybe goodwill impairment in the US. So there's country differences, um, but we do recognise that people will use accounting standards in particular ways. And that, that is something that gets thought about by staff and, and thought about by standard setters. But still, principles will be the way that we try to go forward. Part of your question was also about auditors. And they're in the firing line. They're very much in the firing line in South Africa. They're in the firing line in the UK. The uh, audit uh, regulatory body has all sorts of suggestions out there in the press at the moment. Uh, suggesting things like the audit firms, the big four, be broken up in the UK. Um, uh, suggestions that uh, the um, appointment of auditors goes through a panel rather than be appointed by the firms because of the conflict of interest. Um, where this is going, I have no idea. Um, you know, all of us are members of the accounting profession. You have an incredibly important role because you're bringing up the next generation. And I know in South Africa that accounting education is particularly robust and you spend a lot of time upskilling and creating very highly skilled technical accountants. And you can only be going back to your professional associations and calling for more training, mentoring and whatever um, on the ethical side on it.
Another question. I was hoping that you could just give us a, a snapshot of, of that goodwill and its impairment um, discussion. I know Daryl mentioned the sort of a tension between how to calculate it and, and possibly if it's practical to do it in terms of the time, the, the timing of the information. Um, presumably you've had discussions with preparers, with, with users. Um, so so where, where would you say the academic can, can dig right in? It, yeah. it do, does, does it go slightly back towards different goodwill methods? Is it, a, is it a slightly more philosophical type approach or are we looking for a practical, if you could maybe just give us sure. a little bit of insight, I'll, that I'll would let, be great. I'll let Daryl get you, give you a little snapshot of where we've landed as standard setters, after having been on this for several years seriously now, and then I will answer the academic bit of it about what, what the research is telling us and what the research ha hasn't told us yet. Thank you. The, the, the really big thing is when, when we did the the, the PIR of um, of IFRS three, what we essentially heard back from users of financial statements is that there is no information content whatsoever in either amortisation of goodwill or in goodwill impairments. Amortisation of goodwill because it doesn't actually reflect anybody's real perception of what's happening in an economic in the economic world. Uh, in the impairment side of things, because typically there is so much other goodwill floating around in the entity that you don't actually get, by the time you get to write off goodwill in reality, uh, the proverbial has hit the fan and it's, it's way beyond. Everybody already knew it was going to happen. So what am I learning from it as, as, a, as, a, um, as a user of financial statements? And I'll probably make an extra step on that. When, when we often think about financial statements, we don't necessarily think financial statements only, contern, uh, only contain blockbuster new information. Sometimes they have confirmatory information. They tell you what you were thinking, but what you've now found out. But I think the discussions we had with users in this space was even that. It was coming so late it had gone beyond even that point. So that, that was the one issue. That was what we were hearing on, 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 from the users. From preparer side of things, we were just hearing that, look, this, this calculation is so fraught with subjective type of decisions. What my future forecasts of profit are, what my future tax rates are going to be, what I'm likely to do in how I combine the business or not combine the business. So what the ISB started to try to do was to see whether we could simplify the calculation by taking out some of the artificial constraints the constraint on thinking about how the business might develop over time, the constraint on thinking about how taxation might impact on that business. So on the one side, that would simplify the impairment determination. Um, we also said, thought that we would put in place a, um, a trigger for doing the test. So saying essentially you don't actually have to do the test unless there is evidence that something has happened that that would um, cause you to believe that there was a problem. So that was how we were going to simplify it. On the other side, thinking about how we would make the information more useful, how we would make it uh, better, the one idea we had there was what we called the headroom approach. Now the headroom approach was essentially establishing a high watermark for goodwill at any point in time. So you would be re-looking at your goodwill over time, re-measuring what your, not just your acquired goodwill, but also your inherent goodwill was. And then as soon as you dropped out of that, as soon as you lost some of that, you essentially had a last in, first out type of principle. So what you did was you immediately recognized declines in goodwill, but you uh, were uh, constantly recalculating this high water mark, and any drop off that was measured. And I think that, that's where we got to in, 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 in trying to sort of figure this whole process out, how we could satisfy both parts. I think what we heard in the initial, in the phases of kind of discussing that approach was that this headroom approach sounded wonderful in practice, but it was going to add even more complications to the process. And the concern from the preparer side and from user's side was that they wouldn't necessarily know what the information meant. Because this potentially meant that I could have a decline in my own business's goodwill that triggered an impairment in goodwill, even though it had nothing to do with the success or otherwise of, of, of the business venture. So I think that, that kind of walks us forward to where we are now in this, this, this big step back. And then as a starting point, as an introduction to where Anne might go with this, I think the, 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 the sort of things where we are looking for new information is to understand whether, for example, the balance sheet value of goodwill is actually meaningful. 
Up until now, we've sort of taken the assumption that goodwill on the balance sheet at least means something. It tells you what I paid for goodwill. And so writing that down over time seems to detract from the original usefulness of it. Whether entities right now already provide information about the success of acquisitions. So one of the big reasons people wanted a good impairment test on goodwill is they saw that as giving them an indication as whether management was successful in its acquisition activities or not successful. So how much other information exists in this space? What sort of ancillary information exists there? One of the options that we're thinking about that we haven't explored at all till now is the idea of whether or not you should simply write off goodwill on acquisition. So simply get it off the balance sheet, get it out of the income statement, stop this debate happening at all. Let's keep tangible assets as tangible assets, tangible NAV as tangible NAV. How, to what extent do investors right now ignore goodwill? What is, what is the meaning of on balance sheet goodwill to investors? So th these are the kind of spaces I think in terms of the new thinking where other research, certainly from my perspective, might, might be useful. But then let me give it to you. Thanks, Daryl. Um, yeah, it's such an interesting area. So w what's the research told us? Um, does tell us that um, goodwill as an asset, value relevant. So people that look at uh, large data sets and talk to us about value relevance will tell us that the goodwill asset uh, is value relevant. It will tell us that the impairment expense is relevant. Um, hard to do that calculation comparing what it used to be like under amortization to what it is like when it was an amortization plus impairment regime and going into uh, an impairment only regime because time changes and so much changes that that's been hard for the um, researchers to nail it but those that have had a go will tell you that impairment some of them will conclude that in the impairment only system is better than the amortization plus impairment system, that you get more value relevance around the impairment number than you do around the amortization and impairment. And that's reflecting that, that confirmation, we know from other sources of information, that the impairment is, the, the investors know, the, the investors already know about it, they've been reading the press, they don't wait for those financial uh, statements, but it's, it has a confirmatory value and that's not to be dismissed. The research also shows that quite often the impairment expense is related to economic fundamentals. So although we grapple with all the discontent around the impairment test, the research actually shows us, and this can apply in many countries in many periods, that the impairment expense that is booked does relate to economic fundamentals, which is what you'd expect. And if you didn't see that, we'd be very worried. Um, so sometimes it's hard for economic research to be precise because of the way the models are set up. But that's something that comes through quite strongly, that there are instances where entities have experienced um, declines, declines in their profitability, um, where they've experienced the, the book to market relationship, which is another of the triggers that the impairment test refers to. Um, the CEO turnover um, is also a time when impairment is booked. The old CEO is gone, the new CEO comes, clears the slates, that sort of thing. So the, the research will show all those, all those trends. Um, what research can't get behind is just to what extent that, that test. People tell us, as standard setters, that, that it's costly and complicated and it takes a lot of time but they've also learned how to do it. So a lot of them are much more comfortable now. They've got their models. Um, we do hear from users that they're concerned about how they do it, this black box of impairment. And they're the things the research can't tell us. The research is very much based on the disclosures and the numbers that get observed and modeling around that. Okay, um, another question? Um, Errol referred to the management commentary project. Good. Now, in South Africa, with the whole move to integrate reporting, there's a feeling that we don't need that really, that integrate reporting are giving those information. 
Yeah, so all credit to South Africa to being right up there in the forefront with integrated reporting and great opportunities for you to do research in this area because you have so many companies involved. Um, and one of my colleagues, uh, when I was at the University of Western Australia, was South African and she was looking into this and all sorts of interesting things she found. So it's certainly not a homogeneous pool over in your integrated reporters. They vary a lot in how they're doing it. So for us, management commentary projects are really important. Um, the previous one is a guidance statement. I can't say what this one will be, um, early days in the project, but very important. And we are recognising the importance of integrated reporting. <coughs> We're recognising that as the world's moved on, people are very concerned about this information. They're, they're on the one hand concerned about making financial information more meaningful by the narrative that's around it, but people are also concerned about other information that's not financial. Now, as the IASB, our primary concern is the financial information and that this uh, what we're looking at in management commentary is the narrative information that belongs with the financial information. So you'll, if you look at our materials, you'll see some circles that inter intersect and there's crossovers. So there's areas that our management commentary project won't talk about. Um, there are things in integrated reporting that w w will not be talked about in management commentary because our focus is in on information that relates to the financial numbers and the financial information. Uh, in terms of research, lots <coughs> lots and lots of things there. There's, there's many questions that people may, may choose, choose to look at. Yes. Yes. Yeah, very good point. Um, last time I was here, a couple of years ago, we were just starting to think about primary financial statements and, and management performance measures. And one of the studies that we looked at when we got into the management performance uh, measure space was specifically a study on headline earnings and how headline earnings were used because it came out of the South African experience. And I think what you've just said about integrated reporting is actually a fair point that you should also look at the other way. South Africa's had 10 or 11 or 12 years now of experience with integrated reporting. And you, you mentioned earlier the example of how some companies have got longer and longer and then now they're starting to get shorter and shorter. I think a part of that is the South African experience in figuring out how these different pieces of information that you're putting out are used. And I suspect that might be a place where South Africa could play quite a leading role in the way the ISB thinks about management commentary going forward. You've done it, you've got the experience, you've, 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 you've been here and, and, and figured out how to do it. We've got a management commentary discussion group already going with South African representation on, but this could very well be a place where you can use something nobody else has as a sort of a starting point. So that's a great point that Daryl's emphasising for all researchers, have a look in your own backyard, what is the advantage that you've got? And you do have the advantage for what we're looking at in primary financial statements with management performance measures, that South Africa is the only place we're aware of where you can have the, um, the gap earnings and then the analyst earnings and then you have a, a mandatory one as well. And that's a fantastic setting. For what that, how that can inform, and and what that can show, and then of course integrated reporting being established here for so long, um, great opportunities to look, and a lot of researchers are concerned about where they can publish their work, and some people turn away from their own country because they say nobody's interested in my country, um, the data here, the market's too small, um, yes and no. So if you can find an aspect within your country that speaks to a bigger and wider issue and is informative in a particular way, that will publish, that will publish outside your country because other people learn from it. So I'm going to move on and talk a bit about the other two topics. It's not a slider. Excuse me. It is a slide, I think. Sorry about that, people. Um, so post-implementation reviews, we've touched on, they have literature reviews in them. So there's two ways now to contribute to the post-implementation reviews um, by going and becoming involved in writing literature reviews that are more general or by undertaking studies that are very specific on the topics that are coming up. 
Now, how do we use research? I want to touch on three ways. There's what we might call in-house research, what the IASB and the IFRS Foundation calls research, and that isn't necessarily what academics call research. What academics call research is number three. Um, and I'm going to put an example up in a minute of a paper by Mary Bath with two co-authors. Um, the paper was presented to the IASB board and staff by Mary Bath and one of her co-authors quite recently, and that is a full-blown research paper, as you would expect. And you can get a copy of it from SSRN. It's, it follows that format that I described earlier when I talked about motivating questions, research questions, hypotheses, method, and so forth. Right? That, that's what academics think about as research. But at the IASB, staff and board have another way of thinking about research, and research is anything that informs them about the problem. Anything. So there's um, evidence on a problem. Because remember, at the beginning of my remarks, I talked about evidence-based standard setting, which means ISB and IFRS staff look for <coughs> evidence of a problem. How extensive is a problem? Is there a problem? Disclosure initiative around 2013. A lot of work was done to decide is there a problem before proceeding? So lots of work goes on to find out about the evidence of the problem. Data is sought from a number of places. And we also do this in-house research on something we call effects analysis. So I'm going to bring up some slides and show you things there. I'm also going to talk to you about where we get other descriptive statistics from, and then, of course, the academic research. So if it's in-house, we have this enormous consultation process. Daryl's referred to it already a few times. It is extensive. We are in extensive consultation with stakeholders, and Daryl, Sue, myself, and others have extensive meetings while we're in South Africa this week speaking. And we do that in many countries, and we do it in London. You may also know that we have consultative groups of all sorts with preparers, um, we have consultative groups with users, with national standard setters. So we get lots of feedback in that way. So that's the first point. Second point, we might get information by reviewing financial statements ourselves. So primary financial statements. I'm going to show you an example where we had to go and collect. Staff collected information to help the board make decisions. And then thirdly, we will go and get data from the data aggregators, the sorts of <coughs> databases that you will use in research. So this example is coming from a board paper, and this is where the Primary Financial Statements Project, I realise you can't see it very well. Hopefully, if you have a slide deck, it's clearer. The staff had to go and work out what presentation options were used for joint ventures and associates, because we were trying to decide about joint ventures and associates. We needed to know what people actually did. So they do a review of financial statements, the much the way researchers would do, the difference is, of course, they're not following a research question and they're not applying a theory and all that. They have, a, they have an aim and they collect data. So going into financial statements is something that the staff do. In this example, the staff went into four different databases uh, and the search was around cryptocurrency. I wanted to know how often, well, what we were really getting at, our big question for the board was, um, how often do IFRS reporters have an asset in there, in the balance sheet or in the notes somewhere, that is a crypto asset? Do they have a crypto asset? Do they have cryptocurrency? You know, have we got a problem? Should we, be standard, should we be standard setting for cryptocurrency? Should we? How do we decide? Should we even be thinking about it? Well, we're thinking about it, but should we be doing anything? How do we decide? So this was just a simple search of a number of databases trying to determine whether uh, the companies that actually use the word cryptocurrency. If, if, do they have an investment that they describe as cryptocurrency? So that was coming through databases. Uh, this is an extract from IFRS uh, 16 leases. The, uh, sorry, why have I got IAS 16 up there? That's not very good proofreading, is it? IFRS 16. Um, it's the effect analysis. It's supposed to be the effects analysis. So on our website, we have an effects analysis document that details uh, all the data we collected to show we had a problem. And in these two slides, both wrongly labelled, um, you, you can see diagrams and charts, and 
a number of companies are reported. We're getting a feel for the extent to which companies had off-balance sheet leases, and we, we get data on how many companies, in what countries, and that sort of thing. So this analysis <coughs> underpins the standard setting activity that um, followed and is produced as part of an effects analysis. Just take that off before you see it. Look what I've got up there, IS-16. Sort of, sort of Do you see it? <laughs> is there an IS-16? What is it? Oh, PP&E, PP&E. How could I forget that one? Goodness. Okay, so that gives you an idea, of that's point one, the sort of things we might do in-house. Now, we also have a desperate need of descriptive statistics. We're great consumers of information. So we might take research papers that have got descriptive statistics in them. Um, so for example, uh, Tom Scott was reading something and he was commenting on the paper and he said, just tell me, you know, don't, just don't jump ahead to your tables that are answering your hypothesis. I can't even assess that. I want to know the, I want to know about the population first. I want the descriptive statistics first. Um, and that's a sign of a good researcher and good research thinking. We can often make use of those descriptive statistics, even if we're not so interested in somebody's hypothesis that they might have um, prepared. That might not be the bit we want, but the descriptive statistics can be. So we do take those from academic papers. And other sources of descriptive statistics are studies for Sometimes professional associations sponsor research, you may be aware. ICAEW, ICAS, ACCA are examples of institutes that have funded research for many years and some very impressive research <coughs> reports have come out and there's information in them that we refer to. Uh, the CFA Institute, representing um, certified financial analysts around the world, have been very active in relation recently to um, APMs, alternative performance measures. So uh, in our work, we're referring to something that's a, a cousin, a cousin of an APM, um, a, an MPM, a management performance measure. It, it belongs in the same family as an alternative performance measure or a non-GAAP measure. <laughs> and CFA, um, to my knowledge, has four major reports out, 2016, two in 2017, and another one in 2018. So they're doing very helpful. They're getting analysts in a way that's really hard for us to access them. We don't generally do surveys, but really hard for you as academics. Analysts are not known to uh, participate much in surveys. They are people who have other things to do with their time. So great uh, getting this material from CFA. Uh, this is the reference in your side pack to the paper I mentioned uh, from Mary Bath, and you can get that on SSRN if you wish. And when she presented this, there were lots of people in the room and they were hanging off every word, not because she's Mary Bath, but because the, it, maybe it was because she's Mary Bath, it, because the information was so interesting. It was so interesting. Some of you may know the Baruch Lev arguments um, and the idea that for US data, value relevance of accounting information has been declining for 20 years. It's on a downward spiral. If you standard setters don't do something about it, the world's going, you know, it, it, accounting won't, won't be worth doing. It's a very pessimistic argument. Um, uh, Mary Bath did a few things with her co-authors. She went into line items much more than that research does. She applied different statistical methods to it, and she came up with what she believes very, very strongly that accounting rel uh, information is still, re is still relevant. Um, that, that there is another way of looking at this problem that is not, uh, it is counter to the other line. So as, as researchers, that just reminds us, you can get involved in a stream of research and to get published, you have pressure on you to be lining up with the rest. But sometimes that doesn't serve the discipline. If everyone lines up over there, everyone, everyone tells us that every manager in the world manages earnings. There are some who now reject that claim that every manager in every firm manages earnings. 
Um, but, you know, still there will be papers that are still written around that theory and hypothesis that, you know, there are these people that manage earnings, da, 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 and it follows from there. So sometimes we need to go and just, you know, change train tracks and just try and pursue a different line of inquiry. So this was an example of somebody with a lot of um, skills and a lot of credibility. So this will open up. People will follow this because there's a strong leader who's gone off and done it. Uh, this paper was pre presented to ASAF. So ASAF is the um, Accounting Standards Advisory Forum. It's a body we have where national standard centres and other representative groups of standard centres belong to that body and they come and they bring projects and they bring papers. And this paper was brought by um, the Australian New Zealand representative and the academics presented it and it was on the same theme. It preceded our presentation of Mary Bath's paper actually, but it was on the same theme using Australian data showing no loss in value relevance. So that's the sort of thing that does affect our thinking um, and the board members see this and it lodges in there and as they are reviewing all the information that comes to them, academic evidence becomes part of that as well. So that's exciting. Right, my um, third and final section of my presentation is about what makes research useful for the IASB. So I'm going to pause again for questions. So what is it that would make your research useful? We've been talking about lots of topics, so relevant topics. There might be a, a burning issue for you that you're very interested in, but if it's not on research, uh, if it's not on our work plan, our research agenda or our research pipeline, um, it's not something that we're raising with you. We need work that's on our relevant topics. Post-implementation reviews are a good place to start, but in addition, you can have the research, the research program and the pipelines. We've talked a little bit about lead times, and that's something to bear in mind as you take on projects. Uh, some projects you can do more quickly than others, um, but you do need to keep an eye on the timetable of the research at the IASB. One of the things that the IASB folks appreciate is academic rigor. Academics represent a group that for many of them, they are not biased. Many of our consultative groups are people that are deeply experienced in a particular area. So their views are colored by their own experience, be that as a preparer or as a user of financial information. And, and that's how it needs to be. Of course, that's their experience, our regulators. So their views and what they like to see happen are colored by their own experience. Now, for many academics, that's not the case. An academic can come up with an interesting question and come up with ways of investigating that question and not be wedded to getting one outcome or another. And although there are some academics that argue only studies with significant results get published, um, I think that there is still a place for academics to come at questions objectively and to set up their studies in a way that it doesn't matter what you find, it will be interesting. So academic rigor. Um, there's lots of different methods available, so choose your methods according to what, what sort of question that, that you're trying to address. Um, and I do hope that for all of you, you've got access to um, knowledgeable people in all the different methods and also access to journals, because now there are a range of journals. Um, I don't subscribe to the view that accounting research is only published in three or five North American plus one journals. I don't subscribe to that view. I believe that IFRS is part of an international community and there are journals throughout the world that will publish IFRS work. And so at IFRS Foundation, we're looking very broadly into IFRS work. Um, of course, we're looking at the rigor of that work, and so knowing who authors are 
and knowing what journals they're published in is really important because the journals establish benchmarks for review and they are really a gateway around quality. So all of that matters. But in the IFRS world, if we only looked for IFRS work that was published in three or five North American journals, I don't know that we'd get very much to look at. So um, there is a very vigorous community of international journals and I hope that uh, your work can find outlets in those. There is a problem, of course, with academic work that we, to get published, we copy what came before and we try to change something just a little bit. Because if we just change it a little bit, we can make a contribution. Um, but if it's a lot like what came before, the editors and the referees will be more comfortable with it and more likely to publish it. And obviously, publications, achieving publications is, for many people, a key part of their um, performance. So this does put a dilemma out there because um, for the IF, there are many, many things that are not resolved. Um, and I would hate to think that we don't have to do any IFRS work anymore because we've got all the answers. Um, I would hate to think that reviewers and journal editors are tired of IFRS studies because I'd actually like now for people to go back and repeat things and do things that we did, the early things that we were doing in 2008. Um, now there's many more years and things are different, uh, that we've got more data and we've got more years and we've got different settings. So there's, there's just so much work that we can be doing. Nothing could be further from the truth. And we do need replication studies, particularly because we go across countries and going across countries uh, brings in a lot of methodological issues. So my comment there is to be careful in what you do in, a, in an academic academically rigorous way, but uh, also to be creative. Some of the most, the, some of the most fun papers to read are where someone's come up with an idea and a new way of testing it, and you think, oh, that's just great. They've just come up with new data or uh, a new, new approach. Often when people write their papers, they say, and this will be useful to the IASB, full stop. Oh, good, it's useful to us. Um, we, and then the other sentence is, uh, this will be useful to the ISB as they consider their principles of disclosure project, full stop. Um, so really great if academics can expand on how it's going to be useful, what particular, what particular aspects of it. Now the good researchers do do this, and um, there's been some very, very excellent work that is well designed and, and people can um, use, use their setting um, uh, I'm thinking of a paper by um, Elmer uh, Ventner with um, David Emmanuel and um, Stephen Kahan, where they wanted to try out the idea of how, if, if there was IFRS in the US, how, how this would work. And it was a really neat little way of doing it. And they, they constrained, they were very careful in their conclusions. You know, they, they didn't overstate what they could show. They recognized, because we're doing it in this way, uh, but we, from that we can make some implications. We, can, we think this shows A, B, C, D. There are many examples where people make good use of their settings and try and use that setting to tell us something about IFRS and are very specific about what they're trying to tell us. Um, so it's a real trap not to think it through to see what the takeaway is from the work, what the specific thing you think the standard setter in the way in which they're going to use it. Sometimes it's hard for academics because they are academics immersed in academic work and they haven't spoken enough to practitioners. They have, in some cases they haven't been practitioners themselves, in some cases they have, but sometimes they haven't been practitioners so they don't have the practical experience and they haven't been close enough to practitioners to, to find out. Um, an exception to this is someone like Christian Leutz. Um, who is US-based now, but a German, a German education originally. And he's done a lot on regulation, on IFRS regulation and securities markets and things. And he does get in there and talk to people and, and finds out what's happening on the ground and uses that to inform the way he proceeds with his methods and the conclusions that he draws. So speaking to practitioners, just understanding 
more about the area that you're trying to investigate can help your work be more relevant to the standards that it's. Um, you also need to understand what the issues are. Daryl gave you a brief taste of goodwill. If you were looking at the goodwill area, you'd want to look at the board papers. Um, the staff do an incredible amount of work behind each one of those papers to present all the details of the issue. So it's a good way of understanding what the issues are. If you have a paper that you think the standard setters would like to look at, um, it would be really helpful if um, the, it's written in a way that standard setters can read. So that might be um, having a separate long abstract that's just written for people outside the ac academic discipline. Um, some papers are better than others. Uh, the worst examples are papers that are deeply within their jargon. They just use all their words that they all know. That's their special shorthand. And everyone in that little group knows exactly what all those words mean and, and the way they use, you know, just endless terms that academics have. Some disciplines are much worse for it than others. Um, so your test is go and get someone who's, you know, reasonable, a reasonable person who's not an accountant, to read your paper and see if they can um, work it out. So um, it's got to be accessible if you're writing and you want, and you want the uh, standard setters to read it. And remember that some of the standard setters won't have any training in econometrics, in modelling, so make sure you've got really strong introductions and conclusions that set everything out so that the person can just read the beginning and the end. Because once you start, if you are doing um, statistical modelling in there, there are just some people that cannot, they will not be able to read that. So make sure that your, your piece can stand and uh, the story and the evidence is there without someone having to dive into the modelling. If you are lucky enough to have Tom Scott reading it, he'll just dive into the modelling anyway and sort it all out for you. Um, academics are also always hedging their bets because quite often we're not sure we're not sure how representative this is, and we're not sure what we've really got here, and some people do it and some people don't, and it might mean this and it might mean that, um, and that's really, really hard for regulators or standard setters or people to do anything with that. Um, you, you, if you can, in your work, get to some sort of statements that are clear statements about what you believe, you sh what you show and why you show it, Yes, clearly state what the limitations are, but something that is um, presented in such a way that everything is couched in it might be this and it might be that or it might be this or it might be that. Well, that's fine for academics who can cope with that sort of might be this and it might be that. It's really hard for people outside academia if you're not going to give them some... When I spoke to you about goodwill, I gave you two or three or four statements and they were quite, I said, goodwill as an asset is relevant, impairment expense is relevant, amortisation is not relevant. That's me as a standard setter speaking. If I had one of my academic colleagues in here who's doing this kind of work, they'll say, oh, but Anne, when it's in Germany, it does this, and when it's in France, it does that. Okay, well, that might be the case, and that's where the academics can get into the detail. But you have to try and do some sort of high level now, if it's not clear, don't don't try to to, to lie. Well, obviously, you wouldn't do that. But don't don't try to make it. If it's not clear, it's not clear. But if you do have something that you can say, you know, on balance, it appears, or um, generally speaking, or in most cases, or in most countries, or in most years, just some clear statements would be helpful. I think that's all for that slide, and. We touched on PIRs. The most recent PIR was the post-implementation review of IFRS 13. We called for a literature review through a tender process and we had several people apply and the job was given to a team. There's some um, people from Canada and some people from France on that team. And they produced a um, literature review. There were several iterations of that. They had the benefit of working with the staff, IFRS staff, and a couple of board members as well, and prepared papers and then came in and presented them, and they were January 2018 papers. And the feedback on that was good. Um, from the ISB's perspective, we had the benefit of the work being done by people who are the experts. Academics are the experts in writing a literature review. IFRS um, Foundation staff are not the experts. So it was a great pleasure to, to have the experts and, and have them. Um, 
The board members also made very positive comments on, on that. So we ended up with a very detailed literature review that in the end had to do some US GAP studies as well. It wasn't just IFRS because of the nature of the topic. Um, and then they wrote a short summary as well. And the summary was um, at a higher level. Uh, so all the detail in one paper, but a summary that was accessible to the board members. And board members were very positive about receiving the information. Right, last thing that I'd like to speak about is another example of how we make use of academic research. You may know about the KPMG IAAAR grants. They have, this is round six, and they've been running now since about 2005. So for academic research, it's been six rounds. And this one has just started. In September, these teams came to London and presented preliminary work. So if I just tell you a little bit about these projects and give you an illustration of how we can make use of research and the sorts of things that people take on because they think they'll be useful. Um, firstly, I'd like to point out there are five projects in this round. Uh, first team is from Brazil, so South America. Second team is from Sweden. Uh, third team is US. Fourth team is US. And fifth team is Netherlands. So really pleasing that we're drawing from many countries in the IFRS family. You can see the first one, uh, it's an empirical relevant to the PIR. That's typo number two up there, isn't it? PIR of 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, and 12. We have finished the PIR of 13, and we'll be publishing a commentary on that shortly. Um, second one is the one having a look at IS 37 and contingent liabilities. So I mentioned earlier that We've, we've got work in that area that we're interested in. And so this project crosses over disclosure initiative using IAS 37 as the, the base standard, having a look at the disclosures in relation to IAS 37, and also drawing on extractive activities companies. Um, it's not just extractive activities. They've got utilities in there. It's a European sample. Um, so they're oil and gas, they're not um, hard rock. So that one draws on and touches on a number of things that we're looking at. So that was why that project's interesting to us, because they can draw on, bring together some of the threads. With these early stage projects, we don't know where they'll go. They take feedback from us, but they're their projects, so they work on them, and they, their aim is to find something that's useful to the IASB and then build on and build on. So at this early stage, we could give them feedback saying, oh, we're interested in this, and why don't you think about that, and try and build up more aspects to their work that could feed into standard setting. For that second project, Marie Pennanen's project, they are actually using text analysis. Earlier on today, I mentioned that a lot of disclosure research was off checklists, and some of you in the room may have had the fun of doing that. I certainly have. Uh, tick, 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 yes, no, yes, no. It's quite hard to do, not just from the boredom factor. It's hard to do because companies have the freedom to disclose any which way they want, and trying to fit their disclosures into these checklists can be quite challenging. And another reason why it's done with the brain rather than done with um, AI. But text analysis tools have increased and uh, have evolved and improved enormously. And so there are people having a really good go at using text analysis tools. So that team is trying with a text analysis tool. Not sure how successful they'll be, but they're having a go. Third team. Um, they are serial participants. They've been in a number of grants, this team, or particularly two of them. Uh, this time, <coughs> they're having a look at alternative performance measures. But our particular interest was that they are going to do surveys and interviews, and many researchers do not have the um, ability to do that, and yet that type of work can be, when well done, very informative for us. So we're very excited about that project because of their keenness to actually speak to preparers, to the, to the auditors, and to the users. Um, initially in their interviews, they're lining it up so they're triplets, so it's the same company, preparer, auditor, and user. 
in other work, they'll do surveys and that'll be broader into those communities. So very exciting to see what the, they can come up with for us on that one. Third one, the big strength of this one is the, the huge hand collected data set that they're using. Um, it's for insurance companies in the US and there's an enormous amount of detail and over the years they've compiled a data set and at this stage I'm not even sure what the research questions will be that will come out of this but it's to do with um, the recognition of gains and losses on financial instruments, it's to do with recognition in the P&L, uh, it's to do with impairment other than temporary impairments. So all sorts of questions because they have a unique database. Uh, this team's a very strong team. They are Americans. They're based, two of them at least, at Indiana. And they have a very strong rec track record. And I suspect that they'll get a number of papers out of this and they'll publish them very well. Um, even though at this point, I'm not sure what exactly they'll be doing. Um, they, one of their strengths, one of their strengths will be this unique data. So anytime you can get your hands on data that other people don't have, um, it, it, it's a plus. And the fifth one, uh, it's IFRS 7 and IFRS 7 disclosures. That's a disclosure only standard. And so we were interested to see if this team could look at disclosures in IFRS 7 and explore that a bit because we have received criticism that people are not responding well to IFRS 7, that they're not disclosing as well as they could despite our very carefully crafted standard that tells them what they should be disclosing. So we're hoping that that is also informative towards our work in Disclosure Initiative. Um, the twist that they are using is making use of the expanded audit report and they're wondering whether as we go into a regime now with an expanded audit report, will the disclosures in the expanded audit report be complementary to the IFRS 7 disclosures, or will they be substitutes? And so they're going to explore this idea. So that gives you a flavour of five particular projects that have been brought to us that we are actively involved in. But my purpose in talking about them was to illustrate to you the, just some more nuances about how uh, can find projects and dig into particular parts of our work and also bring together areas of our area. So uh, with that, I think that is my last slide. So um, that sort of research grant program um, to um, go live and run concurrently with our work. Um, and eventually, that, that's not available yet. Those papers are not available yet, but, but as they will you know, in time. So now our I'm up to advertising material. Um, I will um, stop now for more questions and just see, firstly, if Daryl has anything more he'd like to add before we open Hey. Any questions, please? <coughs> um, I've seen a lot of academic literature that say there's a gap between accounting research and accounting practice. And I've read a lot of them uh, that's tried to make um, suggestions to overcome it. But not of them are very practical. And I've recently seen a paper where they did some five projects that will all come out with something and I, I, I predict all five of those will publish in an international journal and uh, it's just a living example of where research is not separate from practice that all those five projects will have something that's relevant to the standard setters so it's not for everyone there are some people whose academic career is focused on an area and on a journal and it's just focused on getting those journal publications because that's their promotion world um, but there are people who want to bridge between the two. 
Um, and we're, they're the people we want to hear from and, and they're the ones we want to encourage. I, I know it's not for everyone and I know that there are incentives at work in universities that don't necessarily make it easy for everybody, but there are people that can do it. And we just, we're just interested in talking to those people and encouraging those people in whatever way we can. Um, I don't know where South Africa's got to in terms of universities and research impact. Is that, uh, has that become an issue, talking about research impact? Okay. In the UK, and it's an issue in Australia. So research impact means that um, that will encourage people to look into regulation, standard setting, audit related work. I mean, audit related work has always been close, always been close to practice. That's the the part of our work that's been so close. Some areas of finance are very close practice and research. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if, if I'm allowed to speculate, I think that there will be more accounting-based research that will get closer to practice now because we're being asked to show research impact. Yeah. In, I want to thank Anne and Daryl. I think a session like this is what, what you start thinking about. And the benefit of it's not maybe today, might be that seed in your head that you're thinking about in a few years' time. But I've enjoyed it. Uh, we've got something we want to give you. Omit is going to give it to you. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your stay in South Africa and that you come again. I know Dad is, is, that was involved and that gave him grants. Not yet. So that's something we can do. So there's a lot of opportunities. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Now there's time for snacks.